my name is Michelle Morand. I am a precision cancer medicine educator and advocate, and I am here with Alexander Rowland, the cancer guy, specialist in precision cancer medicine, um, oncogenomics, genetic testing, all the newest treatments, and uh, figuring out what's going to serve each patient best. And today, Alex has prepared a presentation, as we're reading here, uh, a new targeted therapy for uh, you folks who might be treatment resistant and might have estrogen positive and HER2 negative breast cancer. Alex, tell us all about this new treatment. So typically women with HER2, um, HER2 negative, ER positive uh, breast cancer, which is probably the most common type, um, will get uh, endocrine therapy, you know, which is anti-hormone therapy. Um, and then if they progress on that, they will get a CDK4-6 inhibitor. And okay. then after that, um, it's typically on to chemo. And, and this is kind of a, a you know, the CDK4-6 inhibitors have been a big change because if you progress after endocrine therapy, it used to be straight to chemo. Now we've got these CDK4-6 inhibitors. Now recently the CDK4-6 inhibitors have, or certain ones like the bemaciclib and uh, ribociclib are being used in a non-metastatic setting. In other words, they are actually used for women that are high risk uh, based on unique features. Um, and they are given prior to metastasis in order to prevent metastasis. And they work quite well in that setting. Mm -hmm. However, some women will progress. And for women who do not respond to these CDK4-6 inhibitors um, or have a recurrence within the first 12 months uh, of completing adjuvant therapy, um, usually it means that they have some negative uh, molecular features like the PIK3CA mutation. And typically they're not often, um, you know, they're not often uh, sequenced. So they usually are just typically treated with chemo. Often they'll start with an oral chemo like uh, capocytabine, and then they'll go into intravenous chemo. Um, however, for some of these women and maybe more, uh, there's a new treatment regime. So recently the FDA, and when I say recently, it was November of last year, uh, approved a AKT inhibitor, uh, capivacitib, um, in combination with fulvestrone, uh, for women with PIK3CA, AKT1, and P10 altered tumors. So once again, tumor DNA sequencing is really important here because it determines whether you have mutations in this pathway. This is the AKT pathway is one of two pathways that are uh, prominent in most cancer or all cancers. Some cancers use one, other cancers use others. Eventually all late stage cancers will use both pathways. Mm. Um, but in this particular case, um, there has been a targeted drug, Alpelisib, for patients with very specific PIK3CA mutations. However, um, it doesn't always work as well as it should due to co-mutations, um, which is uh, something that we can talk about at another time. In short, this Alpelisib is not what I would say the uh, the greatest drug for um, women in this situation. And that's because there's a variety of PIK mutations. You can have P10 deletions. Now, Pelicid doesn't work well for, PI or for P10 deletions. And then you can also have AKT mutations and Pelicid doesn't work well for that. Yeah. So, so this really opens up the door. Um, and this drug targets the entire pathway. So it is effective for PIK3CA mutations, P10 deletions and AKT uh, mutations. So um, it's a great, a great new offering for a lot of women, and it can it 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 um it can have a role here in greatly putting off chemo. Yeah, that's so. Uh, this study was called a Cap Itello two nine one trial. In this study, uh, forty point eight percent of patients had AKT pathway alterations. So once again, this drug targets specifically AKT, but the position of AKT in this pathway um, means that it's kind of a bottleneck. And therefore, targeting the AKT part of this pathway is a, is a good option. Um, now, in the study, as expected, uh, almost 70% of the patients had had a prior CDK4-6 inhibitor um, that had been provided for advanced breast cancer. And so advanced means you have progression on standard care. Before we get into this trial, I want to explain something about this trial that was unique randomization was not stratified according to the AKT pathway alterations. Now, the reason they did this trial this way is that they wanted to allow for inclusion of patients with aggressive disease um, because they knew that it was going to benefit them who might not have been able to get tested or their test results weren't available at that point in time, or they didn't have a biopsy to test 
um, or, you know, they just had to wait for the testing and they, you know, they couldn't get the testing results. So they wanted to include those women in this trial. And so what they did was they um, looked at the patients that had the AKT pathway alterations after the trial or after, you know, once they were writing up the trial. Mm -hmm. And so and it, what this means is that uh, some of the patients in this trial may not have been properly matched for the mutation that this drug targets. Mm -hmm. And this is a common confounding issue with clinical trials for targeted therapies. Mm -hmm. um, but in this case, probably for, yeah, practical reasons. Number one, they're thinking of the patients. And number two, they probably wanted to, you know, have a cast a wide net and see if it actually worked in patients that didn't have AKT mutations. Mm -hmm. So um, basically what this means is that the overall survival analysis included patients where the mutation status was not clear. Mm -hmm. um, now recall only 40% of patients had a documented AKT mutation. Um, now, this trial, actually, we weren't able to look at overall survival because it was not achieved in this particular study. We we're just able to look at progression-free survival. So once again, new, um, numerous women in this study may not have had the mutation that this drug targets, and that's the important take-home message. So in this study, uh, the main statistic they looked at was a progression-free survival. Yeah. And the progression-free survival refers to the time period uh, where 50% of the patients in the trial remain cancer-free. So when they first start taking the drug until 50% of the patients are cancer-free. And in this trial, and so that's called a median, um, this trial, it was 7.3 months, and there was a range from 5.5 to 9.0 months. So that's called the 95% confidence interval. Um, and that was compared to only 3.1 months progression-free survival for the placebo plus full Vestron. So this is definitely adding a benefit having this drug. Um, the other thing was the hazard ratio. Um, the hazard ratio is often used in statistics. In this particular case, the hazard ratio is basically one if there's no difference between the tested drug and the placebo. It's above one if the placebo group does better, and it's below one if the tested drug does better. So in this particular case, the hazard ratio 50 actually means that in the capaversative group, uh, they had half the risk of experiencing progression than patients in the fulvestron only group. Okay. So importantly in this study, um, the overall survival was not reached. And that's because the overall survival is a median, just like the progression-free survival. And it's where 50% of the patients on the drug die from the disease. And so it wasn't achieved in this study, which is great. Um, and so here's the overall survival um, figure. As you can see, this is the overall population here. Um, the bottom line is the placebo plus fulvestrant. The top line is the tested drug, uh, capaversitib plus fulvestrant. Yeah. Um, and then down here, you have the patients with AKT altered or AKT pathway altered tumors. And so I suspect that, you know, some, this drug is going to work really well on certain AKT mutations and not so well on others. Mm -hmm. And then other alter, alterations of pathway it may not work at all. And it's going to work really well on others. And then there's going to be the issue of co-mutations. But what we definitely do see is a separation of the curves. So um, we know that definitely in the PK uh, AKT pathway altered tumors has a definite separation there. And even at 28 or, you know, 26 months, the progression free or the overall survival had not been reached. That's a 50%. So that would have been down here. So, you know, the patients are still alive and doing well on these drugs. Um, and what's really interesting is the overall group. Um, and that probably speaks to some of the patients um, not having, you know, not, not knowing of whether they have the mutation or not. Um, we know that this pathway is altered in many cancers, and it's probably altered in most breast cancers. So it's not surprising that this drug was able to create a benefit over placebo compared to patients that were tested. So in other words, just adding the drug, even if you don't have the mutation, uh, could potentially provide benefit. And I think that's an important thing. Mm -hmm. um, now, obviously, you could see the number of deaths uh, in a, a capaversitib was uh, 87 um, now they had twice as many patients there um, and uh, 41 here. So you know, almost similar, similar statistics. Um, side effects. Uh, the most frequent adverse event or side effect of grade three or higher in patients was, um, was a rash, 12.1% versus 0.3%. Uh, diarrhea, 9.3 versus 0.3. Um, and then adverse events leading to discontinuation of the trial was 13% versus 2.3%. So, you know, fairly well tolerated. What's so can important I just, here? Can I just recap? Yeah. Um, so in short, and I know there's so much more, 
it's such a rabbit hole, really. So many. It is. Yeah. But in short, what you're saying is we're talking about a population of patients who at this point, if they didn't try a drug like this, they would be chemo is their option. Yeah. And now we're talking about pause on the chemo, get yeah. on this drug, which is quite well tolerated, as you just showed. We might have yeah. a rash or some diarrhea, but it's OK. And we're getting the. While this, while the progression-free survival says, you know, uh, an average of seven point three months, that graph is actually showing it's quite a bit longer. It's looking yeah. like a couple years, actually. Yeah. yeah exactly. um, so I just want to make that point to those of you watching at home, because sometimes those numbers can look pretty small, and it's like, why would I freaking bother for a couple of months? Or yeah, you know, yeah. is it really worth it? Well, again, what what you're seeing in that in that graph is actually what's at two years, and we're not even there to that fifty percent of patients not being yeah. here anymore. Um, and then there's still at that point either what I like to remind people with all the new drugs and new options that are coming out in that two year period of time, there may very well be new targets for you that, that uh, are, you know, unrelated to these particular mutations, but others that you have. Um, and then you still have this chemo. Yeah. And so, you know, this is the big thing is really in this day and age, new drugs are coming out so fast, uh, especially with the antibody drug conjugates, really, you just need to buy time. You need to stay healthy and buy time. And that's the key consideration to turning this disease into a chronic disease. Yeah. Um, of course, the most important thing is being on the right drug. And so you must get tumor DNA sequencing. Um, but, you know, even in this study, it shows that if you don't have, if you don't have tumor DNA sequencing, you, you don't need your, your AKT, PIK, uh, 3CA or P10 status, you know, the drug could still potentially provide you with some benefits. Mm -hmm. And that's because... Um, most breast cancers are probably driven by this pathway. Mm -hmm. So I see this as being a significant part of standard care in the area after CDK4-6 inhibitors stop working uh, prior to uh, intravenous chemo. Mm -hmm. um, now, you know, we also have some other players that we could look at, but um, I'm just talking in that specific context. So, you know, the real take home message here is get tumor DNA sequencing regardless. Yes. Because the tumor DNA sequencing, when you're looking at 350 to 550 known cancer-related mutations, it almost certainly Jeez. is going to turn up more than just Jeez. that, right? It's it, you'll end up with new numerous targets. What's that? Sorry, genes, right? So I'm getting that wrong. Poor Alex, he's had to tell me five thousand times. There's a big difference between a mutation and a gene. Just to to correct myself, uh, there each gene can have many different mutations trillions <laughs> yeah. so yeah so it's a it's a good thing to correct me on um all that is to say this is exciting because it does insert another option that is quite well tolerated and yeah. before chemo is your yeah. last resort um and yes as we're saying lots of options are coming out all, all the time but i also just want to kind of put a plug in for you to make sure you get good tumor dna sequencing because almost certainly um it will identify other targets for you as well. Uh, and it's a lot easier to get your public health care oncologist on board with a prescription when you can do the math for them and show them that you have the mutation that this drug targets. Yeah, so, and, and this specific FDA approval requires that you do have a mutation in this in this uh, pathway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then there's all this stuff about desensitizing mutations, which as Alex says, we'll tell you yes. about another time. But the point is the more thorough and exhaustive your search up front about what's driving your cancer, those those genes and those mutations, um, the more accurate your treatment can be all the way throughout and the easier it is to get your doctor on board with something they otherwise wouldn't know of. Mm -hmm. Yes. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, so you can talk with Alex directly about your case. He'll review your medical records and look at all possible options based on the most current science-based medicine right now in a one-on-one -on -one consultation. We have a YouTube channel, which you probably know if you're watching this video, uh, new videos every week on all sorts of things. Feel free to drop us a line, leave us a comment, let us know what you'd like us to educate you about. We're happy to make very specific videos for you. You can read more about the trial there. Um, and thank you very much, Alex, for putting this together. Okay. Bye. Take care.